Hey, hey, Dan. Hey. Uh, what's what's the password for your uh, for your PC here? <laughs> this show is brought to you by Interesting Radio. You can find all our shows over at interestingradio.nz. We're born with a natural curiosity, and we have an open mind. We want to learn things. We want to learn how to... F- and I am not a visionary. I do not have a five-year plan. I'm an engineer, and I think it... Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device, and it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner build... Whoa. <laughs> You know, Mike, asking for passwords out loud is probably not very secure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as I uh, arrived at Dan's place tonight, I was picking up a, a camera from him, which was still plugged in, and it happened to be through a, a locked door, and I said, Hey, Dan, what's the what's the code? And he said, I'm not going to yell that out around the side of my house with all my <laughs> neighbours hearing me. May, may comp- compromise the security just slightly, and now I'm going to reach over and make Mike, make the microphone straight. So uh, I don't go on the back of it. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Well, we're, we're always learning about these microphone things. Aren't we? <laughs> we did that last week. What, last week? Last fortnight? Yes. Oh, a while ago, anyway. We did. Passwords. Yeah. Have you got some? Not that I'm going to give you. <laughs> have you got quite a few? I have lots. And have you got a few that are the same? A couple. Yeah. So everyone does. <laughs> So um, everyone's probably got uh, some passwords that they use for their Facebook. Uh, do you use Facebook? I don't. I hate Facebook. Sure do. Oh, I can't stand it. <laughs> um, for your Twitters and your and your email and your mm-hmm. and your your Gmail and all those things that you got. I've got heaps more than that, but that's way beyond the scope of what people want to hear about. But you know. <laughs> yep. All right. Okay. So so passwords. Now you'll be aware of and others possibly, but probably our listeners won't. Is that a lot of people mix up authentication versus versus authorization, right? Mm-hmm. So, what do they mean to you? So, authentication proving who you are, and authorization being allowed to do something once you've proven who you are. Right, and passwords are only the first one, not the second one. Absolutely. Yeah. So the second one is um, will be incorporated into whatever system or application you're using. So mm-hmm. you'll be able to authenticate to Google and say, "I am me," but then inside Google's system, they'll say. Right, now that we know who you are, you've got access to your email account, you've got access to this, 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 and this, but you don't have access to that or that or our back-end servers or anything like that. So yeah. the, the credentials you use to log into Google are likely the same system or the same username and password login system that all the engineers use. Yeah. And, and that's the case in a lot of systems as well. Like, you know, for those of you that work in a big corporate industry and you log into your Windows computer, the guys with all the rights to be able to log in and make changes to things uh, logging in exactly the same way, but it's the authorization that's different. But we're exactly. not talking about that today. So everyone has a password mm-hmm. and has probably heard of this thing called two factor, but there's also one factor. So one factor is literally knowing the password. You've got one thing to authenticate yourself. Yes. And that would be what I would call something you know. Mm-hmm. And two factor, I would call it something you have and something you know. Or something you are. True, biometrics you're talking about? Yeah. Right. So that's just another way of helping to prove who you are. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, let's take a step back anyway. So history of passwords. Yeah. Um, they they go back hundreds and thousands of years. You know, <laughs> the Romans used them. And yeah. uh, um, Shakespeare's got some, some of his plays and bits and pieces. It, it's odd, interesting history. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the with regards to computing, the first was probably... Uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in America. Having I mean that. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> where a lot of <laughs> the very, MIT. Yeah, MIT, lots of information and lots of uh, ideas and, and thought processes and, and standards and things to do with computing came from MIT. Yeah. They had this uh, computer system that they shared time on. And uh, they decided that, well, if multiple people are using this and they've got access to their own files and things, they kind of want to have their files and not others' files. Mm-hmm. So they had, had this rudimentary system of, well, we'll set up passwords. And they were probably quite simple because resources for computers back in the 60s were limited. So yeah. not so much memory, not so much storage. So there was no space to store things like what's your mother's maiden name and then expecting the answer from all these people. 
Yeah, but it was very easy for them to store, you know, two or three characters off the keyboard. Even it could even just be a number because a number you can store in much smaller space than characters. And, mm. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's where the where passwords started from. There's an interesting story about that actually. The they managed to. Oh, there's a mistake in the system and it kind of showed the passwords to everyone when they logged in. It was really, really, really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they also, so they actually used the passwords for authorization as well. Mm. So allowing access to things. And one of the things they allowed access to was compute time because, you know, the, the computer wasn't that powerful back then. So its time was valuable. Mm. People wanted to do math. So they had so many hours a week that they were allowed to use it or allowed to submit jobs to take up so many hours. And uh, someone didn't like the fact that they only had four hours that week. They needed more, so they went and found the passwords and used someone else's account <laughs> and <laughs> used up their time. So, Early day hacking. Early day hacking, yeah. So um, that's uh, one factor, two factor, and a wee bit of history. Um, we'll get into two factor later. Um, I've got one of these really cool little things. I'm going to get shit out of my pocket. I don't know why you're showing me, because I already know what it is. Yeah, you be key. Oh, I'll show you, so everyone, <laughs> everyone listening can see it as well. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's called a YubiKey and it's a, a basically a little piece of plastic with a, a four little stripes of copper on it that go into a USB port and there's a wee uh, capacitive button on it it's not actually doesn't click or anything just senses your finger there and that uh, types in passwords for me and, and uh, one time passwords and things like that it's a little bit more complicated than we need to talk about now yeah but that's my two factor for a lot of the systems I use um, people are probably used to having uh, different types of two-factor. So you've got your, your RSA tokens. You might have seen people in big corporate industries using with their little token that they enter their code and to log into their VPN for work or whatever. Um, some people get SMS tokens or values from SMS. A lot of banks do that. It's actually a really bad idea. Hmm. Um, very, yes. very recently, a, 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 a hack was done. I guess you can call it a hack. Uh, overseas in... Europe, I think. I forget exactly where it was anyway. Um, the signaling that the mobile networks use between each other to send text messages around is totally not secure. And someone managed to actually intercept the bit between the mobile networks. Ooh. So once you actually find out someone's uh, name and details of you know where they're from, and anyway, they, bro- they broke in between the, uh, the, the mobile networks and started stealing information going between phones to they intercepted that that token sms message from their bank to their target and got into their account and stole all their money so okay. yeah sms is actually not a very secure way to do two-factor authentication a little bit off the track but anyway there's another type of um two-factor authentication uh i know of one actually one of our other banks here rather than actually using sms they give you a little card with a uh, a matrix on it so mm-hmm. numbers across the top and letters I down the side I oh, said so, oh, you got that bank so much. I used to be at that bank so one of the reasons I went left them is I hate the card <laughs> it's horrible and and it, you know it's uh, A to F and 1 to 9 or something yeah something and, like that uh, it asks you for three of those things you know A3 F2 and D6 and, and you know you enter those into the website and you know it's cool it kind of works but you've got to fish the card out of your wallet or you've got to have a picture of it saved on your phone which is um, what I did <laughs> and uh, I much prefer other methods. I my my bank doesn't do uh, two factor for logging in, but they do it for large transfers. Mm. So they send you a code and say, "Please authenticate your large transfer of over X dollars," and you can set that value. Yeah, so that's changed with that bank now too. You don't need it to log into inter- internet banking. Well, that that's a positive. <laughs> it was you need, terrible. Yeah, to log in. you only need it for transfers to new payees. That's it. Oh well, that's. There you go. So this is just another level of things that uh, banks do relating to your password. Although the one thing I do know that my bank does is they store my password in clear text. And how do you know that? Because case doesn't matter. (laughs) (laughs) So for the people listening, what clear text means is it's just text that you can read. So if Mm -hmm. you open up on your computer, my my computer, right-click somewhere and go, new document, new text document, and you start typing in there, that's clear text. When you save it, it's not encrypted. It's just, you know, you can close it, open it again, same text. So my bank stores my password, and I I, I can't believe they, they get away with this, but they do. They store the password in clear text. And there's only one way to really know that that's the case, is because case doesn't matter. I mean, my passwords, the letters I use, um, I can make them uppercase or lowercase, and it will mm-hmm. still log me in. 
So yeah. they must know. Well, that's not entirely true. They could actually be lowercasing my password before submitting it through into their system to check it. So that's. But then, then again, why are they removing one level of adding what we call entropy to a password? Yeah, exactly. And there are other ways that you can get a reasonably good idea that your password's being stored in clear text. For example, length limits. Well, is that when you're actually creating it? Or is yes. that when you're actually checking it? Or is it... Well, both. Yeah. So, for example, IRD New Zealand's tax agency limits the length of the password. Yeah, I think actually my bank does as well. I think it's 10 characters and it's way too short for me. <laughs> yeah, and... I presume you're going to move on to hashing next. Yeah, well, and that's what I was getting to for clear text to go into. Well, what's a better way to store it? Yeah. So, so I, I guess my point is that if you're using a hash, it's always the same length. So that's right. Set it doesn't matter if your password's two characters or two hundred characters. Correct. The hash that's right. is the same length. So, yeah. so yeah. what Dan's talking about is a hash. So, um. There's nefarious uh, meanings for the word hash, and that's that's not <laughs> what we're talking about. But the in the computing or the you know the IT term, uh, a hash is a it's a cryptographic function, um, and that's a fancy way of saying a set of instructions to do something with cryptography or encryption um, to turn your password into something which is not your password, but is reliable that you can keep doing it in the same direction. So you can take your password and always be able to generate that hash, but you can't take the hash and go back and get the password. So it's a kind of a form of cryptography. Uh, well, it is a form one of crypto- way cryptography. It's, one, it's one, one way cryptography. So the other form of cryptography is when you, you know, you're you uh, liaising with your, your, you know, your sleeper agent and wherever, and <laughs> you need to send a secret message to them. And, and yeah. So one way to do that is to encrypt the message, and at the other end they've got the right details to decrypt it. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, everyone's heard of Enigma in the World War Two, and and the, the Germans had, and we uh, the the Allies managed to reverse engineer it, and uh, by getting a hold of one, did they actually reverse engineer it, or they just used the machine? I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember either. It'll be interesting to read up about. Hmm. Anyway, the the idea here is that you can take some information and convert it into something which is illegible to um, person monitoring on the side of the road or on on the wire down the road or. You know, listening into the phone conversation, you know, pig Latin, <laughs> something like that. Who knows? Anyway, and at the other end, they can take that and then turn it back into the message. But with a hash, you can't. You take the, the password that you want to store that someone says, this is my password to log in. And you go, well, that's cool. I actually don't want to know your password, but I want to know you, you know it. Mm. So what I'll do is I'll convert it to something that can then be stored, and then I won't know your password is, but I can verify that you do know it because I can take the the password you give me when you're checking it and saying, well, if I do this, these uh, instructions on it, you know, add a six here and compare these bits here and add three million here. And, and it's a big, long sequence of instructions. And you should end up with the same result at the end, which is the hash. And the hash, like you're saying, is the same length. For a given hash function, you always end up with a piece of text or a, what we call a string in computing at the same length. Yeah, and so that set of instructions is what you'd usually refer to as the cipher. Yes, that's right. So some people might go, well, but hang on, can't someone take my my my, my, my password, which is just password or my cat's name, and go, well, can't they just sort of take those instructions and work out a whole bundle of words and see if they match the instructions? And they can. And, and that's one of the things called a dictionary attack. So... Someone could find the list of stored hashes, uh, either by breaking into a system or needing to go and find someone's password that they don't know anymore and try to reverse engineer it. You know, you can get your computer to spend hours and hours and hours checking every single possible combination of what you might be a password, carry out the function against it, and see if it compares, and that's cool. That worked. So there's an extra level of um, misdirection that's added in there. It's called a salt. Okay, and that salt is effectively just saying, well, I've got this in- these ingredients here to make a hash. I'll add a bit of salt for some flavouring, which is, <laughs> is a good way to think of it. That's really all that's happening. And it just slightly changes the ingredients just a little bit. So what comes out the other end can't be constructed by saying, Dan's password is um, blue cat. I don't know why it's a blue cat, but anyway, blue cat. And if I apply my hash function on it, I get the, you know, the 
the string which happens to be a b c d e f okay so that's mm. the that's the hash for blue cat yeah but and then someone can go along and find the, the the dictionary and go blue cat yellow cat red cat green cat and they can go oh that one there is a b c d e f that's the same as what oh that's dan's password i know dan's password but if i actually added um big blue cat so everybody had big in front of their cat but we don't that's a secret word nobody knew that you're using big mm. then when i find or try blue cat it won't come out to the same hash because it's different what i'm being put in on the other end so that's another method that people or it people geeks nerds whatever <laughs> have used to try and um store extra information to try and stop these dictionary attacks yeah the it's the other way that you make ciphers more secure as you make them hard to do right so the um a good algorithm or set of instructions for a hash function is computationally expensive mm. so it takes time to do um okay doesn't matter if to the end user it takes you know three quarters of a second to do but if you need to run through a hundred thousand passwords it's much quicker if you only had a hash function that took a millisecond exactly. compared to one that takes 750 milliseconds 750 times as long to get through as many more so there's a the original hash function used in Unix systems back in oh, the 80s and 90s was crypt, yep. which was very simple. The hash came out as only about 10 or 12 characters long or something. Then we got, oh, what did we get after that? We went to MD5 after that, didn't we? Yeah, which is pretty much just as bad these days. <laughs> yeah, so you might have heard of MD5. Um, I can't think of a way to describe it. Go and read it up if you're that, really that interested. Um, then we had uh, SHA-1 and... R two fifty six and things like that. Uh, there's also a new one called Bcrypt, which mm. is much better. Much uh, and the, the main reason that Bcrypt is is so good is because it's very computationally expensive. It takes a long time to take a given password in computing terms. It takes a long time to take a password and work out what the hash is for it. So, okay, your login might take a little bit longer than you'd expect normally. You know, only by a second or two or three, whatever it is that it ends up being. But it stops people that are set up a computer system to dictionary attack, take a dictionary and run through every word, every combination of words, every combination of, you know, these lists can be huge. Yeah. But if it only takes you a millisecond to check one, you know, how big is a dictionary if it only takes a millisecond to check every word? It's not yeah, very not big. Very. But if it takes you several seconds, it's huge. It takes a long time. Yeah. And one of the ways that they, well, I guess one of the most common ways that they make it take longer is they, do the function multiple times, you know, they might do it a thousand times. That's right. So to actually store my password, I'm going to hash it once and then on the result I get back, I'll hash it again and I'll hash it again and I'll hash it again. And it means that every time you do this, you've got to do it more and more and more to try and to brute force. That's what brute forcing is. Is The easiest way to describe brute forcing is it really is. It's a taking everything, you know, if you've got a hammer, everything's a nail. That's brute force, right? Mm. So take out the hammer I'll just bash the hell out of this desk and eventually the desk will break yeah or but, your shoulder and it's someone's front door oh that, yeah <laughs> that's exactly the same idea right you might have to bash against the front door a few hundred times for it to actually break in mm. but you will get in so that's brute yeah. forcing um, whereas you know if you've got the key it's much quicker yes and the key being your password mm. well that's a little bit about clear text and hashes and salts and how your password is usually stored so you shouldn't really be too concerned when you're entering a password into, I say this with a, a degree of sarcasm and a degree of um, whatever you want to call it, um, most sites will actually do something with your password to keep it, in quotes, secure so that people can't know what your password is. Most. Most. Not everybody does. And this is sometimes ends up being those stories you see, you know, X site uh, broken into and passwords from the last 15 years stolen and the problem is is that the people at those sites go ah oh, we don't need to hash this stuff why are we even bothering it's not that important and all the passwords are in clear text next thing you know all the passwords hey it's another big list of passwords that we can use to brute force with to find other passwords yeah and it doesn't just help them get into your account because it gives them statistics on the common passwords correct so yeah, they well, update their dictionaries to use the common know, passwords do you know what the 10 most common passwords are? They're ridiculous. I'm pretty sure in the top two or three is password. Yeah, it is. So 
I'll just randomly pick a web article here for the 10 most common passwords because I can never remember them, but it's just ridiculous. That's a little bit ironic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because the list is very specific, right? <laughs> So, number one on the list. One, two, three, four, five, six. Excellent. Number two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> uh, number three, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. It may not seem like all that important, but if you look at your keyboard, it's the top row of letters. Mm -hmm. One through eight. Six ones. One through zero. One through seven. Password. There it is. Number eight on this list. Oh, wow. Uh, number nine. One, two, three. One, two, three. Number 10, 9 through to 1. That's, that's actually a lot harder yeah. to guess. Yeah. Uh, number 11, the whole top row of the keyboard. They go on and on and on. The, the idea here being is that um, these passwords are terrible. And th th what it really comes down to, we've mentioned XKCD before, right? Mm -hmm. XKCD.com slash 936. How to number 936. This is all about password strength. And there's a brilliant comment at the bottom. Through 20 years of effort, we've successfully trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but really easy for computers to guess. Yes, we have. And that's basically the truth. All right. So when you try and have your short password, which is easy to remember, and you go, oh, well, I'll change the, I'll put a number on the end and I'll put an uh, exclamation mark there. Uh, I've forgotten what it is. I have to reset my password again. Mm. That's actually really easy for a computer to guess because it's short. And this is where we get into wanting to talk about entropy and complexity of passwords. So this particular XKCD cast, uh, excuse me, cartoon is actually really good at explaining this. So entropy is it's kind of a measure of randomness. So it's got multiple meanings. But in the sense of passwords, password entropy is a given bit depth of entropy on a password is how easy it is to guess. Mm -hmm. So... With zero bits of entropy on a password, you know the password. It's it's not hard to guess at all, zero. If you take a password that if you guess twice and one of those times you'll get it, so the first guess is 50-50, that's one bit of entropy. So it's really, really bad. Mm. And you work your way up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's an example of the one in the cartoon. Um, I think it's Troubadour would be the word, and it's got a capital T and a zero for the O and a four for the A and oh, they just added a punctuation ampersand, you know, the end symbol and a three on the end. It doesn't really matter. That particular password has 28 bits of entropy, supposedly because of how many characters there are in it. There's a, there's a big mathematical thing that's telling you how many bits of entropy there are on a given password. Comes out to like two log in or something like that. You have to go and look it up. I don't need to know it. You don't need to know it. I, I, the, all we need to know is that that particular password, okay, it's, it's kind of secure in that it's, you know, it's more than eight characters. It's got some capitals, it's got some numbers, and it's got some symbols, but it's a word. And that word is easily to, able to be guessed by a dictionary attack. Because one of the things that's done in dictionary attacks to generate all the possibilities for a given word, okay, so that means it's not just one word you got to check. you got to check, you know, 15 or 20 words for that one word is to put one of them as a capital, change the vowels for the letters that you can, or for numbers that you can, so an O for a zero. Oh, that, that's an easy thing to guess, so whoever wants to find your password knows to try that, et cetera, et cetera. So if your computer system is fast enough and you can make a guess of a thousand passwords a second, you will guess that password in three days. Done. Mm, and that's on the low end of speed. Very low end of speed. It, th this is, uh, you know, difficulty to guess is rated here as easy. And uh, then you go, you think about the person that's trying to go, what was, what was the word again? A trombone? You know, I'm, I'm basically reading the cartoon because it's actually really quite good. <laughs> yeah, this is brilliant. You might have heard uh, your friendly neighbourhood geek that you like to chat to you might have at some point said, oh, correct, horse battery staple, because that's the password that they use in this as an example of something that's actually quite secure. It's four words. Except for that password. Well, yes, it's not. <laughs> it's not secure anymore. I'm sure that's tried by all the people. But I would really wish I could use that because it's an awesome password. Yeah. <laughs> it just sounds awesome. <laughs> but it's four random common words. There's no changes for uppercase. There's no special characters. There's no numbers. There's no punctuation marks or anything like that. It's just four words. That has 44 bits of entropy. And it's not that much more, right? But we're talking about logarithmic scales here. It's, mm. it's hugely different. So at 1,000 guesses a second... 
it's 550 years to get it. It's quite an increase. Yeah, from three <laughs> days to 550 years, big increase. So what we're trying to get at here is that a, a complex password is not something that's short and uh, complicated to remember or changing characters and things around gibberish. Okay, gibberish, you know, is slightly more secure than a word that's been modified. Mm. Because, you know, not everybody can work out every option of gibberish of 15 or 20 characters or whatever it is. Less than that, maybe eight. <laughs> yeah, but you won't remember it. But you won't remember it. I know, well, that's not true. Uh, can I think of an old password I've used? No, because that's still being used. <laughs> no, that one's still being used. Yeah, that's not a good idea, Mike. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I, I can remember passwords that are gibberish generated from random noise because actually no, I can remember my Wi-Fi password before I changed it to a new new system, <laughs> and that was a uh, left parentheses um, D capital A three left brace no right no left brace tilde uh, capital B G capital J G N no it was capital N uh, <laughs> left brace again there you go yeah. so that was <laughs> I can remember it because I typed it in cell phone because. Actually, mainly because there was a device that we had on that we just wouldn't stay connected as a mm. uh, long story. Anyway, so talking a little bit about passwords and the best ones to use. The best ones to use are actually long. Mm. So um, probably should kind of mention that the the terminology used for um, storing your, what's called your secret key in encryption. We'll get into, I think we're going to do an episode on encryption at some point. Yes. Um, is a thing called a passphrase. So rather than a password, it's a passphrase. So it's the same concept. It's a um, string of characters or a string of letters and numbers which helps secure an item. And in that situation, it's securing what's called your secret key in, in cryptography. But because it's really important, the idea was, well, let's not say password because that's a really bad idea. It needs to be longer than that. Let's use a passphrase. So mm. a sentence. Yeah. So, and, and this is where you can get into things where entropy is basically things that are easy to guess, right? So you take four random words, correct, horse, battery, staple. They don't go together. They don't make any sense. It's not a sentence. It's a really good password. Mm. However, if you say, um, you know, it's a trap. I mean, <laughs> thinking Star Wars here. Bad or, password, or bad. Good I've got a bad feeling about this. Yeah. You, know, you know, quotes from movies and things like that. Yes, okay, it's good in the sense that it's long, but it's a quote. And that quote could be used for someone going, well, how about I actually create my uh, dictionary attack by using quotes from famous movies? Boom, your password's gone. Yeah, Because it's easy to, for someone to generate your exact password. And that's the, the guts of it is that if a good password is something which is, um, well, actually, a, a phrase is good if it applies to you only or only something that you've made up that you know makes sense to you. You know, the blue house on the corner is three stories tall. Hmm. That's probably not a bad passphrase to use because it's completely arbitrary, but you happen to know there is a house down the corner, it's blue, and it's got three stories. Hey, that'll do. Yeah. But it's not a, f a, a well-known phrase. So. Yeah. So that's a way to generate good passwords. We were talking about, um, yeah, entropy, complexity, and good passwords, bad passwords, and so some good and bad practices. So this is slightly where another idea of finding out things that are, are easy to guess. Okay, so dictionary words, bad idea. Or movie quotes or something, bad idea. Things that are common to people are bad, bad ideas, you know. Uh, to be or not to be, right? Everybody knows that. I'm sure it's going to be picked. Or, yeah. or quotes or, or lyrics from songs. Not great choices. However... Ah, oh, but I'm me. Nobody really knows me. And that thing that they want me to enter on that website to help me remember my password, my mother's maiden name, and oh, nobody knows that. But that's the thing. You can have a random conversation with someone and say, hey, Dan, my name's Mike. How are you? Where, where are you from? Yeah, exactly. And and you just say, oh, I'm from, where are you from again? Invercargo, aren't you? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mike. Oh, that, oh, that's Becky. No, I shouldn't, yes, be, it I shouldn't be mean. Uh, <laughs> It's a lovely town in Vicago. I like it. Yeah, so. Um, anyway, so you, you can have this conversation with someone you've barely met and say, oh, yeah, and, and where's your family come from? Oh, yeah, so what was your, what was your mother's side of the family? What was her name? Mm. And then, boom, I know your mother's maiden name. Yeah. Um, oh, that's cool. How old are you, Dan? Oh, cool. I was born in the same year. I don't have to be, but I can say that, say that. to make it sound good, yeah. right? 
um, oh, what month were you in? Um, oh, you say October or whatever. Yeah. Wow, so was I. What day? <laughs> yeah. Boom, I know your birthday. So I know your birthday. I know your mother's maiden name. This stuff's called social engineering. Hmm. So you can have your information that someone wants to know about you because um, they know your security questions or they know what that particular website lets you pick for security questions and things like that. I mean, this is a bad example, right? We're talking about security questions. They're not passwords, but it's the same idea. Um you have things about you that people can socially engineer out of you just with a conversation can work out. Of course, have you had any pets? Mm. Do you have pets at the moment? No. No. Have you had pets before? Mm. Yeah. Cats or dogs? Yeah, cats. Cats, right. Well, oh, how many cats have you had? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So now I know eventually after the conversation, he Dan really doesn't want, he obviously this is a security question, he doesn't want to continue this conversation <laughs> with me. <laughs> Actually, I... The trick with security questions is to have arbitrary answers. Correct. I was getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> if you are forced to have security questions by a website to say, hey, you need to have these questions answered so that we can help you find your password um, if you forget it, because passwords are easy to forget because you're forced to use ones that are really bad. Mm. Okay. But if you can use one that's really good, four random words, for example, you don't need security questions because it should be easy to remember or using a password manager. We'll get to that. Now, they'll ask you, okay, so here's your security questions. What's your favorite color? What's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? What street did you grow up on? What's your first name, your first pet? All of these things which can be socially engineered out of you. It's great. Use them. They don't have to mean that to you. They don't care what the answer is. So put in whatever you want. So whenever you see the question, what's your mother's maiden name? Then what you do is you put in your teacher's, your first teacher's name. Mm. And it... Okay, they could socially engineer the, that out of you, but they have to know that you've chosen your first teacher's name to put into the mother's maiden name box. Exactly. So, and you can use things that are completely different. You don't have to have something which would commonly be a a security question question or answer or whatever. It can be completely arbitrary. Hmm. Um, it could be, for example, the colour of the the third book on the fourth row of your bookshelf or something like that because that's what, you, what it was and you made it up. It's like, okay, well, I know when I see Mother's Maiden, it's purple. Mm, yeah. doesn't matter. Another interesting way to, uh, if you, a nicer site is one where you can um, put in your own questions and answers, but don't put in questions and answers. Use word association or something. Yeah. So pick a word to you that associates with another one. Mm-hmm. So you might write, you know, you're an audio guy, so you might write down head as the word and phones would be the, the other yeah, word, you know, so, yeah. it, it, something like that. So that you, you have to think outside the square to something that applies to you and you only, that you only know the secret of mm-hmm. and not something that can be found out like your mother's maiden name or your birthday or, you know, your heritage, things like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, in case where I've trapped myself a bit, Windows asks for a password hint. And I often put just the usual password or password at this date. And then I go, I oh. hate you past me because I don't know what that is. And that's the point. Uh, I, I Actually, I can probably count on two hands and three feet the number of times I've written the usual as the hint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. I do actually have, I'm sure you do as well. You've got some passwords which you've just used for forever and a day that uh used on other systems just mm. because they're junk systems or junk this and you don't really care um, and you don't actually mind at all. You have to register for this site to download a file and I'll use that junk password. That'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. So they, we talked about social engineering and bad practices there. So try and make things that can't be engineered out of you or people can't have a conversation with you to get out of you. Um, some other things which came up in the bad... Uh, the password list that we were talking about. Don't use passwords that are made up of a combination of characters and keys on the same place on the keyboard. For example, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's a bad example because it's a string of in sequence numbers as well. Mm. But what I really mean is, you know, ASDFGHJ or QWERTY UIOP. Or you know, ZAQ1234. Yes, that one too. <laughs> so things like that. So things that if you look at your keyboard and just do things in a row, bad idea. Mm. Um, they're on people's list to try. So you mentioned password managers. I did. Haven't got there yet. Wait. <laughs> and try to move your logs. We're running out of time. No, we're not. We're only 35 minutes and That's good as gold. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. So we said don't use dictionary words. 
and it was right after the next one, which is, uh, and I kind of mentioned it before, is, is really don't bother replacing uh, characters with numbers. It just doesn't make any sense yeah. because, you know, all of the nefarious guys know to try that. They'll change all of your capital A's to fours and your E's to threes and your, uh, what else is there? L's for ones and I's for ones and, and mm. whatever else you can think of, like fives for S's and things like that. E- even like the dollar sign for an S, you know, that's all stuff that's, that's really common for people to try. So just find another, a way of having something to so don't try and chop and change letters. It doesn't make any sense. I remember on the old days of the internet, everyone sold Microsoft with a dollar sign because everyone was like, oh, all they care about is money. <laughs> yeah, well, it's exactly the same theory, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> and then you look at people and go, what are you, five? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, oh, and so one of the other things that is a bad practice, just grab the mouse and add that to the list because we didn't have it on the list and it should be on the list there is. Have you got the notes up on two computers? I do have the notes up on two computers. Yeah, and but if, you, it, if you look that way, you keep talking into the microphone, and if you look that way, you don't. Well, I've actually kind of got websites on this one that I'm looking <laughs> at, not actually the list, but yeah, you know, I should add onto this list here, and I'll do here the clicky click of the keyboard here, is don't reuse passwords. Yes. Clickety, 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 clickety. It's embarrassing. My typing is terrible when I'm not looking and I'll go try and keep my mouth where the microphone is. <laughs> right, so don't reuse passwords on multiple sites. So, well, that means that I'm going to have, you know, 100 different sites. Because, I mean, in reality, you end up with a heap of sites you log into, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's 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 list off a few that you might think of and go, what is the password for that? You've got your email. You've got your Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram for those that use it, uh, Snapchat. Um your computer at work, your computer at home, mm-hmm. your, uh, I'm struggling to think of things here, I'm sure there's heaps of things, <laughs> you can end up with, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens, Often, you know, I have I think my password manager's got a couple of 300 entries or something in it, yeah. so if you don't have um, the password being used on the same password being used on multiple sites, then you're going to have to remember 300 different passwords, right, how do you remember 300 different passwords of four different words? You don't. You don't. It's much easier to use a password manager, so a an application. There are several available. You um, just have to do a bit of a hunt around. Uh, one I use, and I think one Dan uses, one called LastPass. Yes, like and the show notes. <laughs> I, I just shook my head and growled at Dan because that link in the show notes, guys, is his referral link. So every time you sign up through Dan's referral link, he'll actually get some free time. It, it's it's not a free application to use. There is a free level, but there's a premium level which gives you more features. But anyway, so I was just annoyed that I didn't think of it first. <laughs> password managers. So you want to have a password manager which looks after all your passwords for you. It, um, it, it might sound like a really bad idea. Well, what am I entering all my passwords into this application for? I'm going to, you know, that someone's going to get that application and get into it. But the idea here is that the password manager is in quotes, secure. It um, it takes your passwords and encrypts them and stores them in such a way that you have to unlock them with a master password. And it's, it's more complicated than that. But in any sense, you're an application which lets you have all of your very different passwords for all of your very different sites that you log into and it will store them for you and you can go look them up. Yeah, Easy. and if we would recommend one, it would be LastPass. We trust it with our passwords, so it's a pretty good bet you can. <laughs> wow, do you sell it or something? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, but... I think, you know, you hear all these, like, use this password manager, use this yeah, password manager. My recommendation has always been LastPass. But for me, I, I did a big analysis of a whole bundle of products to try and work out which one I wanted to use. Some of them were really nice, but they're way too expensive. Yeah. Like Dashlane is one that's quite popular, um, but I think it's like $50 US a year, and it's quite expensive, really, when yeah. it comes down to something to look after some passwords for you. Um, LastPass, I think, is like $12 US a year. It's yeah, dollar a month. Pretty reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll move on from password managers. I kind of mentioned those. If uh, we're happy to, t- uh, if anyone wants to get in touch and ask more questions or have a point or anything, you know, f- drop us an email. Yeah. The the other before we move on, the other thing you can use password managers for is to store your gibberish answers to security questions. You can. Most of your sites have a place to enter comments, so you can put in the comments. You know, these are the security question answers, hmm. but you don't need them because you've got a password manager storing <laughs> your password. <laughs> But you can store other things as well, like your your Wi-Fi passwords and your credit card details. Um, like uh, I think 
I don't trust my credit card details to it because uh, for some reason I I just don't. But I do have I do use the the built in Google Chrome uh, yeah. storage of of that because it's so much so easy to use. Um, that could probably go underneath password managers. Then. Yeah, that's where I just moved it to. Oh right, I'm busy watching the our notes application here update <laughs> from one side as Dan moves it around. And anyway, so. The the other nice thing about a password manager, which Dan has just typed in for me to prompt me to talk about, which is well worth mentioning, is you can have what's called a dead man switch. So uh, you, you go and Google that term. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. Basically, the idea here being is if someone dies, something happens to stop things bad happening. You know, you're operating a expensive bit of equipment like a scissor lift or something. There's actually a foot switch you've got to have your foot on. So, of course, if you get knocked over, the thing stops moving because you're not holding down the dead man switch. Mm. Same idea with the password manager. If I don't keep bashing that button once every three months or, you know, keep using it or something or whatever it is, it goes, hmm, I haven't heard of Mike for a while. I'm going to send uh, an invitation to Dan to have access to Mike's passwords because it turns out he's actually died yeah. or something like that. And it means that there is a method now for your family, friends, et cetera, et cetera, to clean up after you uh, and they can log into all of those sites that you probably shouldn't have logins to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any. Honestly, I don't. Um, that that you would like people to have access to. For example, um, email, pre- Facebook, email, Twitter. Yeah, things like yeah. that, so that you can actually make some closure for people or hmm. close down accounts or access to logins to um, like financial institutions that you might have stuff on or yeah. credit cards or... Things like that, so you can actually get in to deal with things, you know, mm. returning things to um, different providers or perhaps a whole bundle of packages have been bought and, you know, from Amazon or something and you want to return them all and you can, oh, I can now log in and yeah. work out to return them all because there's no point in them being here. It's just, it's, it's more hassle. Mm. So that's just another function of password managers, which is quite nice. All right. So what about writing passwords down, right? So rather than a password manager, which you've got to pay for and it's complicated, another bit of software you got to learn. What about just having a notepad with all your passwords in it? Would you consider that secure or not? I don't do it myself because I have a password manager, but yeah. And you did right. It is actually not a bad thing to do. It's not a great idea, but it doesn't actually hurt to have your passwords written down somewhere. Um, there's, I guess there's two different things. Don't do it at work and leave it in your top drawer because... Yeah, that's where people go looking for it. That's where people go looking for it. And if people are the chances are much higher of someone breaking in to get access to your computers. Correct. But the chances of someone breaking into your house and wanting to get to your computers rather than steal all of your stuff. That's right. It's a much lot, lower. Yeah. Much lower. Yeah, so there's no harm in, in having a piece of paper with your passwords on it, but try not to store it on the desk beside the computer. Perhaps actually do file away in a, a drawer somewhere. But uh, especially for those of you in a corporate environment, um, you need to be extra vigilant with your passwords. Um, it, it, a lot of people think, ah, oh, it's work, I don't care about it, it's nothing to do with me. Yeah, but there's liability at stake here. So yeah, your, li- your liability, you could be the one that ends up being the one that let someone in to get access to that confidential information which completely destroyed you know, that segment of your company. Hmm. Um, you don't want to be in that situation, so you want to make sure your password is not secure. Uh, sorry. Is secure. secure. <laughs> is, is very secure. <laughs> And not sorry, weird. sorry. Not, what not a, people from what company are you talking to at the moment, Mike? That you want to gain to access to? <laughs> what? No one. <laughs> <laughs> I in one of my previous jobs, I worked as a as a what do you call them? An IT help desky sort of problem solver. You know, yeah. The thing called that they call it break fix in the industry. It's a terrible job, horrible. Mm-hmm. But the number of times you talk to someone and they say, "Oh, my password. I don't want to know your password. I don't need it. I don't want it." And you can't get the message through. Oh, it doesn't matter, but I don't want to know it. And it's not because I think I'm special and I can get into things that they can't, you know, that I don't need the password to do or I or I don't need, you know, or anything like that. It's a liability thing. I don't want to know it because if I do know it, then something happens. But he knew my password. Exactly. And I don't want to be in that situation and you don't want to be in that situation. It's, it's one of those things you, you just don't want to know people's passwords unless something you know, really bad happens and you need to know that person's details. For example, an accident, they've passed away, they're in hospital, they need their medical information, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So, yeah, writing down, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, maybe, I guess my only suggestion would be maybe apply some kind of really simple cipher to it, like, you know, if you've got a list, 
move the list of names down by three so that they don't match up exactly. Oh, that's a good idea. I never so, thought of doing that. Something feel, you know, simple that you'll remember and you can you know, tell your loved ones so if they need to go and get them, they can. But just so that you know, your garden variety burglar can't log into your bank and steal all your money. Right, so what Dan means is if you've got, you know, your, I keep saying Facebook even though I don't use it, <laughs> Facebook and Twitter and Instagram written down and in your email, um, if you want to get into the email, sorry, if you want to get into the Facebook, which is the top one, go down three on the list of email and use that password. That's what. It means. Mm. And, but it's the same as if you use your Twitter one, go down three to the one just below email and use that one, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you get to the bottom, wrap to the top. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's not a it's not a hard cipher. And if someone puts their mind to it, they'll work it out. That's right. But it's enough to stop most people that would break into your home from using Correct. them. But just, just simple little things. But the, the, probably the easiest thing is use a more secure password and what we've said is longer and something which really comes down to being a bundle of random words that make no sense in the same context together or that only make sense to you specifically. Hmm. Um, that would basically be what it come down to with, with passwords. This really turned into a bit of a sermon about good password security. Well, it did really, but you know, it was kind of did explain you know what a password's about and, and yeah. I think it's important to try and get that out. That's one of the things that I've noticed is just... I actually really guilty of it. <laughs> my, my password at work, because you know your corporate passwords typically they're set to expire, which is actually a really bad idea. Because really, if, really bad. if they are secure, okay, they're a big long uh, set of words that are really hard to guess. It's gonna, like taking an example of the cartoon, it's going to take five hundred fifty years to brute force. For example, there's no need to change it. It's fine. Hmm. But those companies that enforce password changes every ninety days, all it enforces are people to go. Oh, I can't remember a new one. Oh, I'll make it. I oh, know. I'll make it the smallest I can make it, and I'll put a number on the end, and then I'll just change the number every time I have to change it. Yeah, not secure at all. I know some people that are up to like fifty. <laughs> you can't see this, but I just raised my hand. I, um, I think mine's at fifty-seven. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> but it it it's it drives me up the wall. Um, but okay, I. I the thing is that my password is not actually made up of a word of the dictionary. It's a bundle of characters, and I know the sequence, but there's only one bit of it that changes every time it needs to refresh, so it's still secure. And I know, yeah, I know the number, so, well, actually, everyone else does now. But, yeah. <laughs> but only you know where in the password Correct. The number and is. what the rest of the characters are, so it's not a big deal. But the, the point being is that it's actually, it encourages bad password um, it does. practices. So I, I, I'm against companies putting in that, but you, you can't explain it to some people because... Uh, yeah, you even showed them the research papers that have been done. No, nope, don't want to hear it. Yeah, well, the uh, thing is, the, th the I think the thing that ruins it the most is that um, it's actually built into the software that manages all of the user accounts in those big corporate environments. Part of Windows software is there's a section mm. in there that talks about password expiry and complexity requirements. It's like you're just enforcing bad password practices. It's also built into things like PCI compliance and HIPAA and all oh. those kind of. All the things that people deal with, financial information or medical information, yeah. have so to adhere the, to. The wrong decisions have been made at some point by people that don't understand complexity and entropy. Um, so Dan said PCI compliance, that's that's um, processing card payments. Yes. And HIPAA in America is the medical privacy laws and things like that. Mm. And we've got similar things here in New Zealand, but um, it, it's just frustrating how systems are built backwards and as... You know, we've been trained for 20 years to learn passwords that are really hard for us to remember, but easy for computers to guess. I think that's a perfect place to leave it, Mike. Probably is. Anyway, folks, that's, uh, what are we called? Tech Explainers. Oh, man, that's really embarrassing. Yeah, to think about that. I did scroll. I was actually thinking of trying to do two things at once. It doesn't work. <laughs> right. See you, folks. Uh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, 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 what? You come up with something else. You can visit us at techexplainers.com and send us some feedback to feedback at techexplainers.com if you wish. Feel free to correct us on anything that we're wrong about. We are notoriously lazy and can be a bit unorganised with our research. Yes. Like me today doing my research about five minutes before we sit down at the microphone. <laughs> but anyway. Um, and you'll see us uh, every when, no, every second every Wednesday, second Wednesday. Uh, online and the opposite Wednesday will be on live, not live, will be our recorded session on Otago Access Radio, 10 a.m. on Wednesdays. So uh, that's all for us this time, folks. Next time. See yeah.